Okay, um, good morning, colleagues. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's World Bank series. My name is Kitsipirone Sheila Matsukri, and I will be the one chairing the session. So for today's session, we are presenting on AI in writing, implications and over implications of over rights. And we are honored to have presenters from the right side, which is Dr. Pietron Art and Ms. Sonica Berzer. So uh, Dr. Pietron Art is the head of the UFS Writing Center and he's a published author. And he's also a former SUSI study, which is the study of the United States Institution for Scholars. And um, he's also a fellow of the National Institutes for Humanities and Social Sciences. And then our following speaker will also be Sonica Kotza. She's an academic writing specialist at the University of the Free State, and she creates learning content, uh, training consultants and in writing centers and practices. And she also made, she's also a mentor at the writing center. Her research focuses on student engagement and student voice, academic literacy, and academic writing. So for this session, I just wanted to say that um, for people that have questions, you can just write them on the comment section. And then after the presentation, just then read the questions and um, the presenters will then answer the questions. So uh, without talking for a long time, I would love to give over to Dr. Beard and Ms. Soniker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ketcher. I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Dr. Piet van Aert. I'm the head of the university's writing center, as, uh, as was mentioned just now. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Zonika Kutzer, uh, who's an academic writing specialist here at our writing center. So uh, the, the topic for today, over relying on the unreliable AI in writing implications of over-reliance. So welcome to everybody who's attending. Um, what today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the implications of over-relying on chat GPT generated text. Uh, but before we start, I just like to give the following disclaimer that while we are by no means experts in AI writing, we are in human writing. So the session today will be presented from the perspective of an academic writing specialist. Uh, we are aware of the advantages of AI, but today what we're talking about is about students who over rely on it and students who insert a prompt into the chat, copy and paste what ChatGPT has generated and then present it as their own work. <coughs> Our fear is that an increasing number of students who used to work through the whole writing process in order to make their voices heard by the scholars um, they are addressing are now choosing to disregard their ideas, their arguments and their voices. They are misguided by the notion that submitting an AI generated text is better, but this comes at a price. While these texts are grammatically and structurally eloquent, these are products of algorithms. And so students who submit these texts not only deprive themselves of the opportunity to learn and grow as academic writers, but also silence their own academic voices. In doing so, they also present texts that are questionable and contrary to belief, not well written. So today we're going to discuss the following. We'll provide a quick overview of why we should attempt to determine if a text is written by AI. We will also revisit the telltale signs that indicate when a student has over relied on the system to produce their text. This is especially important now while AI detection tools still lack credibility and reliability. Moreover, we will review a text from an academic writing perspective to determine if ChatGPT generated texts are as well written as students are led to believe. Finally, we'll discuss how questioning questioning assists consultants to not only discern if a text is produced by AI, but also enables them to reintroduce students to presenting their ideas. Finally, we will also cover interventions proposed by different academic departments. 
So detecting AI generated text is crucial in the context of the university. The greatest aspiration behind detecting these texts is academic integrity, as it ensures fair evaluation, prevents plagiarism, preserves intellectual property, and addresses ethical considerations. Being able to detect AI generated text presented as student text is also the first step in reinviting re students to present their ideas, their arguments, and their voices. Zonneke. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, so yes, uh, when in, in our previous presentations regarding um, AI and and how we experience it at the writing center, um, we uh, delved quite deeply into what we can see um, or what human-centric approaches we can use in order to see um, whether text was generated by AI or not. And we found through our research as well, and it correlates with the research of other scholars, that AI writing, as we all know by now, um, presents flawless grammar, uh, longer sentences with combined ideas, it lacks a personal voice, is often errors regarding recent events, even though the new updated version um, does not transgress as much in this relation, but still um, it, it, it remains risky to, to just uh, use whatever it has generated for, for one's academic texts. We've also realized an idiosyncratic structure, so it has a way of writing that, that it, yes, it, it mirrors academic writing in a way, but it's, it's not quite there yet, if you may. And yes, the questionable citations, even though with the update, this is also aimed or they aim to address it by now, but it, it remains fairly questionable. So what we would like to do today is to have a look at AI text from a writing center perspective and judge these texts, if you may, to, to see whether these texts do indeed write well because we are worried if students mirror this writing style of ChatGPT, that they are losing opportunities to, to grow as academic writers in the way that one would expect from a university student. If, if they submit the text just as it is, it's greatly problematic, as we all know, because they lose out on, on the academic writing process. Um, they can often feel isolated because they do not um, convey their ideas with their peers or consultants at the writing center or their lectures. But even if they use these texts um, to, to lead their way of writing, it can be equally problematic. So what we did was we analyzed um, ChatGPT generated texts as one would do at the writing center, as a writing consultant will do, um, to, to see whether this text uh, will be able to adhere to the academic writing principles that one expects at university writing. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just quickly going to introduce some of the principles. Uh, bear with me. It's just to indicate um, what we were specifically looking at. So um, with an academic introduction, we looked for some background information to indicate uh, why this topic is important in the first place. Uh, we looked for a thesis statement. Um, some stance on the topic or an opinion on the topic. And we also looked for some direction in, in, in chat, um, chat's academic introduction. So does it indicate what will be discussed in the academic text itself? We also looked for an academic formulation of a thesis statement where we can clearly see what the topic is and what the commentary 
might be on the topic. So if a student is expected to write an academic text, we often expect from them to have a stance on the topic, to, to have something to say, to make what they want to say known in one sentence quite early in the text so that the reader knows what the overarching argument of the text is. Or at least a goal statement where the reader will be able to know what the overarching idea of the text is, so what, what will be investigated in the first place. So we asked ChatGPT to write an essay on sustainable food systems. Now, we, we did not prompt it excessively. We, we had one little prompt because this is quite often what um, students do when they use ChatGPT. They just ask the question and uh, they, they use the information that, that it provides. So we did not excessively prompt um, because even if students excessively prompt, we are still of the opinion that if they excessively write and if they excessively engage with with um, literature from other scholars and the writing process and peer reviewers and writing consultants they will still write better texts than what we can see in front of us so we asked it to write an essay so already we expect a certain structure from the text um, it did provide some background information. However, the background information was very vague. Um, we do not really know what the importance of the topic is after reading the background information. And once again, as we said in our previous uh, presentations, it really struggles to create a thesis statement. We presume it is because for writing a thesis statement, one must have a stance or an argument in the first place that one would like to prove through your text. And it fails to, to generate this possibly because it does not have arguments to prove in the first place. It also produces headings and subheadings for, for, for essays, uh, which is perfectly acceptable in longer texts, assignments, dissertations, and so forth. But usually for an essay, this is uh, an anomaly, <laughs> if, if you may. Um, but but um, that is what it produced. As I said before, it's background information, very vague. There's no indication of of the importance of the essay or where the author came from, if you may. So why the author would like to investigate this in the first place. Um, and also some of the, the goal statement, um, or what you would expect in the roadmap actually seems to appear already in the background information. The goal statement also quite uh, problematic. Um, it's first of all, it it resembles some sort of roadmap. It's also a little vague, and and one does not really know what the essay will set out to do after reading um, this text. It also repeats itself quite often. Um, so much of the information that you see in the introduction will appear again as listed statements in the text itself, but even in the introduction, quite a few ideas are repeated and shuffled around in its attempt to convince the reader. It also gives key concepts in an essay, which was interesting to see. Once again, it's beautiful in an academic text or like an assignment or a dissertation or an article. Um, but in this instance, it's it's not really <laughs> what we expected to see in um, an academic essay. We also had a look at the body paragraphs that it produced. So in general, in academic writing, um, we have as many body paragraphs as we have ideas. That's what we um, 
also encourage our students to produce. We generally start with presenting the main idea, supporting the main idea, and um, concluding the paragraph to either move to the next paragraph or to reflect on what was being said. And we, when we have our supporting ideas, we encourage students to make those ideas matter. So to support their main idea in its essence. So in order to do so, students need to explain their topic sentence. They need to introduce evidence. They need to make sure that those evidence are available to the reader. So they need references. Um, the reader needs to know that what they say is scholarly sound. They need to unpack this evidence um, for, for the reader and also explain this evidence. They, can, they cannot just have random ideas related somewhat to the topic. The reader needs to receive something that will convince them that the, the argument is indeed sound. And then they need a concluding sentence. So what we looked for in ChatGPT's topic sentence is something that has a clear topic and an idea that will be developed. So when we have a look at ChatGPT's body paragraphs, um, we realize that it contains three sentences. And that's not an issue, but in, in ChatGPT's instance, it seems to be a, a, um, a habit, if you may. It has a subheading, but if you take a moment to read the paragraph, you will see that it is very vague. There's no ex concrete examples or evidence to support the claims about um, the practices. Uh, it mentions various aspects of, of um, agroecology uh, and how it promotes biodiversity and reduces uh, reliance on synthetic inputs, but it does not provide uh, specific examples or data um, to illustrate how these practices can actually uh, benefit or influence um, agriculture. And it also, it's also not clear what the relationship between these ideas might be. So if, if this was a student's text at the right site, we would ask them a few guiding questions and Dr. Piet will talk about that later in, in our presentation. But we would guide them into providing solid information uh, and information that will enhance the credibility of, of their text as, as well as detailed explanations and um, to clarify the significance of these practices in the first place. Its topic sentence, um, one is not sure really what this paragraph will be about. They mention, it, it mentions um, the, that the integration of ecological processes into agricultural production is at the heart of sustainable food systems, but um, not much is really said to support this. Um, here we have one little sentence of support um, um, to, to, to convince the reader. And um, the concluding sentence is actually not that bad. It, I like how it transitions to the next paragraph. The problem that we have with the concluding sentence is that it wasn't really discussed since the topic sentence wasn't supported and the paragraph does not convince the reader. And we found this pattern in most of the body paragraphs produced by, by ChatGPT. What's also um, interesting is how it um, talks about agriculture in general, quite often many of the ideas that it produces can relate to non-sustainable agriculture as well. So um, it, it really grappled with producing something that's specifically related to this topic um, to convince the reader. 
or, or the pa body paragraphs, you can see that yes, it has a topic sentence, more or less. Yes, it has fairly well written concluding sentences, and there is some evidence, but it does not convince the reader. The evidence is not enough. The ideas are not not substantiated, and the um, the ideas are not developed. It also produced information that was not really requested, that does not adhere to the prompt, um, and information that was also not indicated in the introduction. So it comes to the great surprise to the reader to suddenly see challenges and opportunities. While it somewhat relates to the prompt, there's no indication how this forms part of the part of of the argument or why it's part of the argument and once again as with the previous information the the arguments provided here or the attempts of providing arguments are not not substantiated so it's actually not very well written once again there's no evidence that's explained there's no introduction to the evidence. There's no unpacking of the evidence. Um, and the topic sentence is also not, not explained or clarified to the reader. When it comes to what we expected from a conclusion, we expected something that at least indicates to the reader why what they said mattered. So some restatement of position, a summary of reasons. Um, so once again, informing the reader what was achieved through the text or what the main finding was of the text, why this is the case, and then some final thought. And I must admit, if you have a look at its conclusion, at first glance, it doesn't look that bad. Um, we we have a restatement of of thesis, and we have some form of summary of reasons, and and we have a final thought. So the recipe, if you may, is there. But if you analyze the information in the text, in the conclusion, you realize that it restates an idea that wasn't discussed, that wasn't substantiated, that wasn't developed. Um, so it presents an idea as a final um, finding, if you may, but the reader has no idea how this finding was achieved in the first place. Also, some um, vague information about a uh, uh, prosperity and and how the planet will, will be preserved and, and sustains prosperity um, for all. Um, once again, it's not the strongest of final thoughts. Uh, the reader has nothing that they need to think or feel or change after they've read this text. It's a very general bridges on cliche um, sentence to end the text and and then that weakens an already weaker text um, so it's it's not something that we would like our students to mimic when they they write their texts we went a little further and and we asked it to write two more essays um, regarding compare um, regarding sustainable food production we just changed the topic a little bit so we asked it to write an essay about maize production so how to produce it sustainably or the significance thereof as well as corn and then our amazement <laughs> slash amusement um, began the first thing we realized was if you ask it to write a text um, about more or less the same topic it plagiarizes itself. This is the ChatGPT 3.5 version, so it is the free version, but it is the one that we've noticed students use quite often. So on the 11th of March, we asked it to write an essay uh, about the importance of producing maize sustainably, and we also asked it to write an essay about um, the importance of producing wheat sustainably. So if 
two students use ChatGPT to write their essays about more or less the same topic, one could safely assume that um, the following will be present. So there we have our topics. You will see that it generates either more or less the same idea. So here we have um, a pivotal role in global food systems, which relates greatly to one of the world's most essential crops in its introduction. We have serving as, serving as a stable crop or a primary source, and millions of people around the world, billions of people around the world. We have the little however sentence that it likes to um, include in its introduction. So conventional methods of maize production, conventional methods of wheat production. Um, here we have significant environmental costs uh, contributing to soil uh, degradation, water pollution, um, which relates greatly to the, the toll on the environment. Um, depleting soil fertility, consuming vast quantities of water. Um, and the one essay at least indicates that it will also discuss biodiversity um, in, that will feature somewhere in the, issue, in, in the essay. But here we have once again the importance of producing maize, the significance of producing wheat um, and food security, food security, environmental sustainability, and socioeconomic development. So already in the two introductions that it produced on the 11th of March on more or less the same topic, not the same topic, more or less the same topic, it provides generic information. So the problem is if a student uses this for, for, the, for their content of an essay, already they are introduced to information that is contact. They might have found other ideas if they did research. Um, they might have found ideas relating specifically to maize production or specifically to wheat production, where we are now faced with information regarding sustainable agriculture, more or less. As I said before, at least the one essay <laughs> includes the idea of biodiversity, where the other one includes the idea of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's that's at least something that was different in each essay. And then it continued to provide the same main ideas uh, as was predicted with trying to analyze the introduction. So two students will, will face the same information and, and it becomes an echo chamber, if you may, where students read information from ChatGPT, they produce information from, chat, from ChatGPT um, and there's, there's no way of breaking away from what ChatGPT says um, where if they did their own in research i'm sure they would have written a text that will one convince the reader but that will also inform them about their discipline that will make them more comfortable in their discipline with new knowledge that they were able to acquire but i digress <laughs> let's have a look at the plagiarism that took place in these two texts. So you will see that it starts off by playing around with the same ideas uh, regarding food security, um, crop resilience, and soil health, and diversity of, of cropping systems. And then here from the third body paragraph, socioeconomic development, it starts to blatantly <laughs> plagiarize itself. So word for word, the same ideas are presented. More than the same ideas, the same sentences are presented um, in this text. It also happened with challenges and opportunities, more or less word for word of the same ideas are presented. 
So students not only run the risk of not being introduced to scholarly sound information, but they also run the risk of plagiarizing because it plagiarizes itself if more than one student uses it to to produce a text with more or less the same topic they run the risk of of being um, accused of plagiarism as well even in the conclusion there wasn't um, a great variety of ideas once again, the same problems that we have with 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 its writing, but in this instance also the the great amount of plagiarism evident in ChatGPT's texts. We ran it through copy leaks and found that the two texts have a ninety five percent plagiarism, so um, it's it's highly disconcerting. We also thought, well, what if we mark these texts as, as academic um, specialists and academic writers? How will chat fare, if, if you may? How will it perform? So we set out to mark the texts um, that, that it produced. And I, I must admit, because it writes so problematically, it's difficult to mark. Um, yes, there's some information there. Yes, the structure from a first glance looks appropriate. But because the text is without a development of argument, we will find quite a few sentences that are just presented in paragraphs without being developed that only relates more or less to the topic sentence or to the greater topic, if you may. And it also repeats itself quite often. What we realized um, happens the most often in these texts, and this is this is what we found most worrisome, is because of the vagueness and because of the general ideas that it presents, it does not really answer the question. So in this instance, we saw that quite a few ideas relate to agriculture in general, not even sustainable agriculture. Much of what is said in this text can be said about agriculture, um, even if it relates somewhat to sustainable agriculture, it's not related to the topic, so be it wheat or be it corn. So if a student uses this information, it does not answer the question because it does not develop an argument regarding the importance. So we couldn't find in these texts any indication of what is sustainable maize production in the first place and and why producing maize sustainably is important or significant we have a text here about general agricultural practices some um, sustainable practices but the topic has not really been unlocked or supported for the reader so it's we we have established that yes, ChatGPT Chat ChatGPT plagiarizes itself. Its structure is a little worrisome, but in essence, it does not really write well. We also assessed the text using the analytic scoring rubric. So um, there it as one could predict, did fairly well when it came to um, vocabulary, um, usage, mechanics. Um, so this is its strengths, if you may, the flawless grammar, if you may, even though it uses a few words um, in, in a creative way <laughs> that one would not expect in, in an academic text. Um, it, it does well 
when it comes to how language is presented. But when it comes to how the ideas are presented, so now we are looking at um, organization and content. Here it struggles a bit because of its informal style of writing, its um, predictable style of writing, its inability to convince the reader of its argument, and also because of the ideas that are just listed in paragraphs without being developed, without indicating to the reader why these ideas matter, what the ideas' relationship, relationships are to, to the overarching argument or, or what these ideas mean for, in this instance, sustainable agriculture. So, in, in essence, sorry if I can just go back there, in essence, ChatGPT will pass, if you may, if, if one uses a rubric like that. He will either get 19.5 out of 30 or even 20 out of 30. So it's a pass mark. If one just analyzes the text according to how it's organized, the, all the content, um, and if one places great emphasis on the language of the text, the grammar of the text. So we wondered, what if we evaluate its argument according to a rubric? So despite generating content that's not substantiated, ChatGPT still generates content. So, and we wondered how it would fare if we create a rubric for, specifically for argumentation um, that focuses on the argument and then assess its text. Since such a rubric was not available for us, we, we created our own. We had a look at quite a few um, rubrics from different um, disciplines, different uh, institutions, um, even websites <laughs> to to um, to create a rubric. And we also considered what we encourage students to do when they develop an argument in the writing center. So how we lead students to develop an argument and what we deem as as a well written argument or a well presented argument. And we created this um, argument, uh, evaluating the argument rubric. If you may, it's still in its baby shoes, but it it relates greatly to what one would expect from an academic text. So the purpose of an academic text, and I do, do not need to tell you, but this is what we tell students, the purpose of an academic text is to convey what you have to say, what you believe, what you found, uh, what you read, what you, what you know, and the text should convey what you would like to say about this in such a way that the reader is influenced. Your text should relate to the topic provided to your read by your lecture or to your research topic, your hypothesis, um, your research questions, and your argument should be clearly developed and convince the reader. So one cannot just in introduce new ideas after new ideas in, in one little paragraph. One has to take an idea and really substantiate it, develop it. And when we uh, evaluated ChatGPT's argument, we realized, well, in this instance, it will not pass. It, it will not do so well, if you may. So in this instance, it's difficult to establish its argument. The claims are not relevant to the topic in most instances. The key points are mentioned, but there's a lack of support and analysis. 
Um, there's very little insight provided to the topic. The supporting ideas are disjointed, so idea after idea after idea without indicating the relation to the main idea, the overarching idea, and also why it matters in the first place. And also minimal evidence. In this instance, no evidence has been included because we didn't prompt it to include some <laughs> evidence of research um, and, and little relevance to the main argument. As I said before, it produced a general text about general agriculture with a little bit of sustainability. And it's difficult to see how its ideas progressed since ideas were not developed. What we would like from a, an argument is, and that's what we also encourage students at the writing center um, to produce and what our consultants guide them into is an argument that's relevant to the topic, that's persuasive, that's developed, that's supported by compelling evidence, um, that has some form of analysis of the evidence that relates to the argument, um, that provides suspicious, sufficient, su not suspicious, that that I presume will be the text that we just read, <laughs> that provides sufficient um, support provide um, in, in the text, and also that the main idea clearly links to either the thesis statement or the goal statement or the research question um, or the overarching argument of the text, and that the connections of the ideas are evident for the reader so that the reader can see what it is that the student would like to say and understand why they would like to say this and follow them in how they are saying this and why what they want to say is significant in the first place. So as we said in our previous uh, presentations, chat has a way of writing. It has a way of structuring texts, but it also presents a way of structuring content unless you do not un unless you prompt it <laughs> excessively. It provides content that does not convince the reader. And if students rely on this, they run the risk of pro providing content that will not convince their readers. And then their voices are lost because at the Writing Center, we are firm believers that what students want to say needs to be heard. And that's what we do, what we do. So in order to help them to become scholarly heard, if you may, in, in, in the scholarly discourse, so to make known what, what they want to say and what they believe and what they found, and the fact that it's important, um, and this is something that they lose when they use, over rely on, on an unreliable source. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Aert. Okay, thanks, Annika. So we've discussed now what these, you know, what the characteristics would be of an AI generated text. And as we know, uh, we have this problem at the university, but now what do we do with it? How do we address these challenges. So the next short part of this presentation will just be about what we can actually do when we're put in the situations. Now, when you, the, the difficult thing is obviously it's 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 difficult to unquestionably prove that a text was written by AI, um, and so the most effective way to to determine whether it was produced by AI or not is to is for a human being to ask questions to the person who is presenting the text. Um, this also isn't 100%, um, you know, conclusive, but I'd like to just um, have a look at some of the questions that we ask as Writing Center consultants to, you know, for our students who come in with their texts. Um, and the, these are, uh, the irony about this, this is this is as old as, almost as time because this, that brings us back to uh, Socrates and uh, you know Socratic questioning. So we use questions such as, <clears throat> can you explain the main concepts and arguments in your paper? 
You know, if a student presents an almost flawless assignment, but they're unable to adequately explain its content or show or they show limited understanding of the topic, uh, this probably indicates that they, you know, they've used an uh, uh, AI generated uh, tool to, to produce the text. When we ask them, can you tell me about your writing process? How did you form this opinion? Uh, what were your research methods? If a student is unable to provide info about the sources of their ideas or specific details about their research process, again, it might suggest, most probably does suggest that they've ever heavily relied on AI. When we ask them, can you prove more information about this sentence or passage in your paper? So you identify a specific part of the paper. Uh, what did you mean with this sentence? Um, if they struggle to do that again, uh, you know, if they if they they don't they cannot explain what they meant with something, you know, most probably they they um, they, they 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 over relied. Um, so at the writing center, we often ask these questions to hold the students accountable for their work uh, and their academic opinions. We ask questions to invite them to showcase their understanding, their analytical skills, their ability to relate ideas to the assignment prompt or the assignment topic. Socratic questioning also enables students who did produce their own text to improve the text under the consultant's guidance or under a lecturer, whoever uses these questions under the guidance. However, we did notice that assessing the coherence, the depth, the alignment and originality of their responses can help uncover instances of plagiarism or lack of genuine engagement with the material. Uh, sorry. So we also ask questions about the students, you know, about their expected topic, uh, their main argument and how they supported it. The answers to these questions can be instrumental in detecting the plagiarism. When students have genuinely or genuinely engaged with the assignments, they should be able to clearly articulate the intended topic and its objectives. If they struggle to explain the expected content, it may suggest that they relied on external sources, including AI generated content, instead of understanding and addressing the assignment requirements themselves. By asking the students to state their main argument, you can assess the clarity, the coherence and originality of their ideas. Plagiarized content, as we've seen now, often lacks these qualities, as it may be a reproduction of a pre-existing argument or ideas. <clears throat> Inconsistencies or lack of depth in examining the main argument can indicate the use of external sources. When you request information about how they supported their argument, it helps evaluate the depth of the student's understanding and analysis. Plagiarized work may lack the ability to provide coherent and original supporting evidence or may rely heavily on verbatim copying from external sources. Analy analyzing a text as from students Analyzing the text, students' language proficiency and writing style throughout their explanation can provide insights into the consistency of their work. So if there are significant disparities in vocabulary, tone or style compared to the previous submissions uh, or the previous demonstrated skills, it can also be indicative of plagiarism. So we also ask questions about the um, Sorry, it's the same thing. So yeah, so again, just some of the questions that we ask there uh, it enables, it'll enable them to explain and express what they've learned, the process they've gone through uh, and so forth. So it boils down to, we would need to have the human contact and the human questioning when we wanna figure out whether something has um, been plagiarized or not. So asking questions allows us to gain insight into the student's comprehension of the topic and ensures that they take responsibility for their scholarly arguments. By probing their thought process, we can understand how they arrived at a thesis statement, a hypothesis, or at main ideas. Most importantly, engaging in question and answer sessions encourages critical thinking and facilitates a deeper understanding of the subject matter and their own written work. While advancements in AI have made it challenging to distinguish human written texts from AI generated ones, students who generally authored their drafts will willingly discuss their ideas and research. This approach has always been a part of what we do here at the Writing Center, 
uh, and our methodology, even before the advent of AI. And so we think that it can bef benefit any lecturer who would like to use this approach to, to reinvite their students to write their own text, to present their own ideas and to bolster their findings with research. Right, so some of the. So that is what we do at the Writing Center. We, we go and we, we, we really ask questions and we and we guide the students, as Zonica said, we guide them to developing the argument. Some other departments, academic departments at the university, they take different approaches. So some, you know, some some will opt to to inform students that uh, AI generated text will be penalized. You know, each department seems to have their own rules uh, as far as we 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 can uh, as far as we know. Um, so so many departments approach it as a form of plagiarism, which means then you know points deducted or getting zero or something. Some, some some departments request that the students, sub, you know, those who are suspected of submitting AI generated text should redo the assignment completely. Right. One department that we know of even calls students in to do oral presentations of their submission. Um, another department has gone back to physically writing in class, whether it's tests or assignments, the students must do it there. The interesting thing there is, uh, and this is research that is still in process, uh, is that the students are actually improving in that class, in that course. Their marks compared to previous years are actually better. These are now for the students who are sitting in the um, in the class and doing the assignments right there. So at the Writing Center, we, we have evaluation forms of sessions whenever a student comes to us and they sit with their assignment or their essay and afterwards we have evaluation forms filled in by our consultants and they would indicate on these evaluation forms whether they think this has been generated by AI and then we send that back to the lecturers and then it's up to the lecturer to decide the approach that they take so we cannot tell the lecturers uh, you know what to do but we have these examples and we have our suggestions of, of questioning. OK, and so um, that is basically what we've wanted to discuss today. Uh, our main concern is that with, uh, you know, over relying on something like ChatGPT, uh, it's more than being dishonest uh, or lazy. Uh, it's disregarding the students' own voice in favor of empty eloquence. And that is something that we really want to work against. So uh, I hope that there are questions that we can answer. If there's anything unclear, if there's anything that you would like, maybe as an academic, any um, uh, supporting documents or anything like that, maybe the rubric that, that Zonica um, used, uh, anything like that, we will be more than willing to help uh, and assist with. So thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much. Well, this was a very informative, wonderful presentation. Um, we have some questions on the chat. I'm just going to read it out loud. Uh, the, the first one is that, uh, well, it says, in your own personal opinion, are there any strategies or tips uh, that lecturers can follow to minimize the AI over-reliance? Um, obviously, this was earlier. I think you did answer it a little bit. But yes, you can add more to that if you want. Um, the second question is from Peter Smith. He says, I'm wondering as an added measure to having departments rely more on the writing center, is there any available research so far on how structuring and scaffolding writing assignments could help to um, dissuade the use of AI? Um, yes. You can also just check there on the comments. Uh, yes, what, I just want to hear what you think of that. Okay, well, I'll just jump in on the first question. Um, Sonica, if I may. Uh, so we've, we've, we've provided a few um, strategies and tips. The most important one is asking the questions. Uh, we found that with the students uh, coming into the writing center, if they didn't write it themselves, the assignment, it's very difficult for them to answer the, these Socratic questions. It's basic questioning and we we would hope that you know lecturers would, would resort to, to doing that. Um, and then another thing might be you know some of the um, the rubrics that Zonica has, has used uh, that can also really help in this regard. Uh, Zonica, if you want to do you want to jump in on the second question maybe? 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Van Aert. Um, yes, I, I think the two questions also relate greatly to each other. Um, I think it's important to notice that over-reliance on, on AI is not the problem. It's it's the symptom. Um, the, the, the problem is that students struggle to write at university level, and then they resort to using AI writing. So what lectures can do from the onset, I presume, and I'm no specialist, and um, to prevent this in the first place is to be there for students during their academic writing process. And that's where um, Peter's question also comes in. Is there available research on, on scaffolding writing assignments and how this can um, persuade students to not rely on AI as much. Um, there's, there's not much, Peter. Um, most of the research that we came across is about how AI can either benefit students, which is true, um, or how AI um, provides students with erroneous information or disconcerting information or how AI writes problematically as we we have illustrated. But I, I think that might be, as Dr. Van Aert also said, having students write with you and be it in your class or unpacking the topic with your students. Um, and, and I know that's what we do already, but then also making use of extra available resources, as Dr. Van Aert said, and then making this available to, to students, encouraging them to know that uh, our, our um, head of department, Michelle uh, Hubert, Dr. Michelle Hubert, wrote a beautiful piece um, on, on the SALP website about how writing is difficult and how that is part of the journey and how um, moving through this is as important as knowing content. So, um, and I would just like maybe to add there, yeah. Zornica, um, Peter, your question also, when it comes to, to scaffolding, writing assignments and so forth, um, are we, we're busy looking into um, the importance of the argument itself. Uh, to students mm -hmm. to develop the argument, as Zonika alluded to when she um, showed that 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 um, that thing imaging that rubric of hers, that um, perhaps we should you know move a little bit away from really you know putting so much emphasis on the language use or construction. We we'll still include that, but maybe put more emphasis on developing the argument because that is essentially what we want students mm -hmm. to be able to do. And that is uh, the, the the shortfall on the AI side. So once lecturers hand out their assignment topics, um, part of you know what they want from the students and they must communicate it clearly with them is the ability uh, to, to, to develop their argument. Um, there's another one there. Um, my worry is that the more we try to get students to avoid the use of AI, the more they will find shortcuts to use it. My question is rather, how can we assist students to use the tools responsibly? So personally, um, I think it's a very difficult thing to, to teach somebody to use a tool like this responsibly because if it's there to make things easier, I do not see students changing their approach to using technology. Technology is being used these days to make things quicker and easier. So I know that there are lecturers who are looking into, you know, the responsible use. How can we actually use AI or something like ChatGPT to our advantage or, or something like that? Personally, I don't see because that means you will have to change the way people are using technology. That I do not know. I do not see because you will have to re-educate the people. And so personally, I am not of the opinion. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not part of that clan of, uh, of of researchers who are looking for ways to to use it responsibly. So, so I'm sorry. I don't have a positive answer to that. Uh, so, Zonika, I don't know if you've got something to add to that. Uh, it it is it is difficult um, be, because of chat's unreliability. Um, 
I think if if one focuses on the writing process and divides that up for students, um, I don't foresee them relying on it as as much as they might have. So um, that that's the closest <laughs> answer um, that I can give. But it's 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 difficult um, since one is tempted to take that information. Um, and and use it as one's own. I, I see, uh, uh, Mr. Obama, that there is there are some lecturers also who what they do is they would take a prompt uh, and an essay written by ChatGPT and ask the students then to analyze it, mm. but which is a good exercise in critical reading. But the problem with that is you say. How are you going to do that with first years who do not have the reading knowledge yet of the topics? And so once you use chat GPT for that kind of purpose, you would have to presuppose that your students have the necessary knowledge to be able to critique a text uh, you know, in a field. And so that means that they will have had to go through the reading and writing processes, the proper academic ones before getting to that stage. And so I'm just afraid that once we start using it for that kind of purposes, we are skipping those really important uh, foundational blocks of, of, of the academy. Uh, Zonika, there's something for you, I think, from mm. Lee. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Art. So Lee says, um, relying on AI is a symptom um, students challenged of, of students challenged with academic writing. So these discussions could be extended to secondary education. So they're in the high schools already. In the library, orientation of first year students, students indicated that from secondary level, they use ChatGPT to help them with their assignments. And educators do not educate students on the challenges for research at university level. And yes, I think we are all familiar with the disparity between high school <laughs> education and what students are expected here. Even before ChatGPT, the jump is very big um, and students have to go through quite a lot in order to write in the way that we expect them to write at university level. They come from a system where writing creatively and writing argumentatively um, differs quite a lot from what we expect over here. And 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 yes, I think even more than we've done before, we have to invite students to one, know what they want to say matters, what they think about the topic matters, and why they write matters, because it is to equip them with knowledge, to convey knowledge, um, to to sh to remind them constantly of the fact that they are scholars in a scholarly environment talking to other scholars and how important this is for their growth and also for what they will do in the future for for those after them so continuously reminding them of their voices and the fact that we want to hear that um, and making known the resources available to them if they struggle to to convey what they want to say and also to invest in unpacking topics, the writing process itself, and um, making sure that ChatGPT, if they would like to use it responsibly, is used at its most as a as a personal assistant, which was is its um, intention and not a co-author. Um, so here we have uh, another question, the prevalence of using AI due to writing structures, grammar, or knowing how to coherently present in an argument in research. So is the prevalence, um, it, 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 it might be. Um, quite often people think if a text is grammatically flawless, it's well written, and that's not the case. And um, we see students who come with texts that that really needs a bit of grammatical assistance, but what they say is clear to the reader and they just need a bit of help with how they want to say it. So I think many students um, 
think that ChatGPT writes better than they would, and it's not the truth. Um, I've seen texts that really need assistance that are still so much better than the text we've just seen because students want to say something and they've researched something and they want to convey what they've researched. Very cool question. I um, I see. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you want to say something? That no, I'm just saying. I see. There's another question being typed. Uh, I just want yes. to piggy piggyback off uh, Zonica's uh, response to that question. Um, as you would see, the two essays that we've marked now, uh, the one is uh, got a mark of 19 and a half out of 30, and the other one 20 out of 30. Now, we did use the rubrics that did not. Um, allocate any marks or do not pay attention to the argument, the defining and developing the argument. So either we will have to relook the way that we make up our assessments and what we require from the students, or you know, students they can get by if they just use AI and so on. And um, you know, it, it's good enough, but then we have to change our the way that we want to mark. I see uh, Arkilas, Michael, you've got a your hand up. Thank you so much, and thank you for that wonderful presentation, Irunsha. I'm going to just switch on my camera so that you can see that this is a real human and not an AI. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the presentation. There's a lot to think about in this context. Um, one thing that I would love to just conceptually stress test Within the Digital Scholarship Center and within the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, we present obviously the Wayfinder series, which is is, is here. And thank you uh, to Kitsapile Ono for, for leading this. Um, but it's also very important that we do these sandbox experiments. And I'm thinking a lot of the independent research that is taking place all, all over campus and in the country, because we're part of a much larger network, can really benefit from some of these conceptual experiments and ideas. Currently, just to give you perspective, we, we're using generative AI experiments to try and see how to effectively use it as automated marking, how to effectively use it as a recommender system, which is a completely different assessment type tool, how to use it as a dialectic agent. So how do you, you know, when you have a conversation, what is its actual knowledge so that you can learn from it? Exactly as Onika said, the personal assistant side of it, right? But there are a few thought experiments. Like let's say you have group one and you give them a particular task without generative AI and group two, you give them a task with generative AI to try and compare what are the benefits and what are the disadvantages. And so I guess what would be, what my question boils down is a really wonderful way in which we can stress this some of these ideas could be between the ICDF Digital Scholarship Center and the Writing Center because I see a lot of different types of investigative research that can come from this. Um, yes, on the one hand, the publications are great, but the most important thing here is exactly as Onika pointed out, there's a huge devoid in the AI for Ed space, especially in Africa. We don't know exactly what, where, and how. And we're learning this. Um, I, I don't see uh, Dr. Gray Stopford or, or Dr. Ina Ghost in, in this particular Wayfinder, but they are working on a study to promote the guiding principles for um, what does plagiarism, what does academic misconduct actually mean in this age, and how do we interpret it as academics? And I think. This, this particular session of yours gave us a lot to think about. And I would love to, for everyone in the in the chat, as well as to you, to open the in invitation between the Digital Scholarship Center, the Interdisciplinary Center, and uh, the Writing Center, because I think there's a phenomenal set of investigations that we can do for the benefit of the field as we're concerned about the future of knowledge. Not thinking about it in a punitive way, but rather going to the fundamentals, as you had pointed out, you know having students think through what they do. And that's important. That's something that will withstand, hopefully, the test of time. So let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. It, it, we would be really interested to take hands and to research, um, because at the end of the day, if we can find a way 
to go forward with this, it will be to the benefit of the students and for their education. Uh, recently, I heard somebody speak and they, at this university, they had a discussion on how they're using AI because they're cutting out assessments uh, because they hate. This was a lecturer saying that he hates marking. Now, then you shouldn't work at a university. But anyway, um, so. And the, the same person said that the students aren't here to to learn. They're here to get a piece of paper. Now that approach, we must just be. You know, that that's just something that once we have a look at using these kind of things, we must just be careful not to go down that path and just see, well, this is a shortcut. If the students aren't allowed to take shortcuts, then we shouldn't be taking shortcuts. So we will have to work together with you guys to learn more about how these things can work, what the pitfalls are, but also what the advantages may be. Uh, us coming from a writing center, obviously it's very traditional in the sense of what is required, uh, what we ask of our students, uh, and we try to guide them to that thing. So, and you guys are almost the opposite with, you know, thinking very much forward and stuff. And, and so it'll be great to to take hands and come together and see, but listen, what is the realistic middle of the road kind of thing that we can maybe take hands on? So let's do that. That'll be fun. Thank you. Zonica, there's a last one there from Peter. If you want to jump on that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, our class as well for the for the invitation. Um, we are student centered, so if it helps the students, you can count us in any day, any time. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I see here from from Peter requesting the um, or, or suggesting the possibility of lectures asking students what their writing process was and assessing that formally. Um, that's that's a really cool question. It is something or suggestion. It is something that is slowly being integrated into different modules um, so that students can indicate how they conducted research if they use chat what did they ask it? What, what what did it say? So they have to basically provide screenshots and what they did with that information. So um, using chat as a resource, not as, 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 as assistant, it's not a resource, as an assistant um, and, and indicating how it fits into their research. Um, I, I, I think that that's, that's something that's very feasible. Um, and it will also show students how what they want to say um, needs to be the reason for what they write at the end of the day um, and taking accountability because that's something we also do at the right side. When a student produces a text, they have to take accountability for what they say for us to move forward with with the text. And um, I, th I think that's that's pretty beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow, this was actually a very informative session. Um, I just have one last question. I it just this is just for because we're going to upload this on the Blackboard AI for Ed. Uh, when it comes to the right side, is there a system that you guys follow? Like, can lecturers send students to the right side, or do students willingly by themselves? Like, how does the how do you guys work with students and lecturers? So some lecturers, um, they send their students to us and we want to motivate lecturers to do that. Uh, tell the students to, to come and sit with a consultant to help them with their research or their assignment. Uh, other students, uh, they just book by themselves. So they just send an email to uh, right site at ufs.ac.za and they book sessions themselves. So we have many students, the majority of our students come voluntarily, but some lecturers uh, do require their, their, their students to, to, to come to us. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Beat. Um, yes, I, Ms. Zonica has shared a document with us. Uh, thank you so much for availing yourself for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it will be uploaded on Blackboard and also on the lab guide in the library but the slides will be shared with everyone. And thank yeah. you very much for having us. Yes, I see thank Miss Linda so is it's typing. I don't know if she's saying goodbye to us or <laughs> something, but uh, you are please, you are please welcome to speak if you want. Oh, she's saying thank you for the session. Thank you so much. Thank you.